And I said, if this elephant gets up and walks away, I'll look so dumb. Yeah. I'd be so <laughs> embarrassing. So I was quickly able to put it in the vein and she went back to sleep again. Then he came back to me like half an hour later and said, how was it? I heard that uh, the elephant almost walked away. And I said, yeah. yeah. So where were you? I mean, I was like, <laughs> you should have come and helped me. Then he's like, no, it's good. I heard you. Well done. You, you managed it. Yeah. He said, yeah, that's how you learn. I'm like, oh, that's a very <laughs> steep learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> this week's episode is recorded on location in Entebbe. And we'll be exploring the incredible world of mountain gorillas and other great apes, as well as a form of conservation that works. I'm super, super stoked to be joined by an awesome, awesome guest who you will get to meet in a bit. So get yourself comfortable, <laughs> maybe grab yourself a pillow or a blanket, maybe also get a cup of tea or hot chocolate or coffee if that's what you prefer. And just create a beautiful, safe, comfortable space as we get ready to take this journey together. Today's podcast is made available by our patrons, and if you'd like to join that community, there will be a link down below in the podcast notes. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll find that in the video description below. Nuggets from this conversation will also feature on the African Safari Podcast. The Africa Safari Podcast is a sister podcast to the Jonathan Benaya Podcast, and together with co-hosts from all across the African continent, we bring you an immersive safari experience. Both the Africa Safari Podcast and the Jonathan Benar Podcast can be found on all major streaming platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube Music, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio for those tuning in in the US, Pandora, CastBox, Deezer, and all other major streaming platforms. I'm your host, Jonathan Benar, and this is the Jonathan Benar Podcast. <laughs> What's up, my beautiful people? Welcome to the Jonathan Benaya Podcast, a show that is wild, <laughs> very wild. We are proudly Uganda's number one conservation and tourism show, but we also benefit from a listenership from all across the African continent and the world at large. We try to put out a new episode every Sunday with discussions ranging around how to make the natural world a better place, creating awesome images, telling stories with words, wildlife films and photography, with occasional musings on sound and tech. If these topics fascinate you as much as they interest me, I promise you this podcast will have you in a spin. I do share a lot of my personal experiences, and from time to time, I'll have one or two guests on the podcast to have some very insightful discussions. So thank you so much for tuning in, and enjoy your time here. All right, guys, welcome back to the Jonathan Benar podcast, where we talk about the earth, words, wildlife films and photography, tourism and travel, and occasionally music. My guest today is Uganda's pioneer vet, whose years of determination, willingness to learn, and innovative thinking have created change in a world that needs it the most, our natural world. And it's for this that she's gone on to win numerous accolades, including the prestigious Champion of the Earth Award from the United Nations. She is a National Geographic Explorer, and she's had her story covered so widely by both international and local press. And in the beautiful words of UN Messenger of Peace, Dr. Jen Gudo, my guest is a huge difference in the world of conservation, and she's an inspiring example to both young and not-so-young people all around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, the CEO and founder of Conservation Through Public Health, CTPH, and the deeply rich in test, Gorilla Conservation Coffee, the one and only Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> and thanks for having us out here in beautiful Entebbe. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So doctor, it's 30 years since you made your maiden trip into um, the gorilla kingdom where you go to see your mountain your very first mountain gorilla do you mind just taking us back to that particular day and just help us paint an image of uh, what that was like for you yes um i would say that it was a really life-changing experience yeah i had always wanted to i'd heard about the mountain gorillas first while setting up the wildlife club in high school at Chibuli Secondary School in Uganda. Yes. 
And when I first heard about them, when I was in the wildlife club offices, they told me, I said, when can I see them? They said, they're not yet habituated. So that when tourism began in 1993, I got the opportunity. They told me then that now they are habituated. And so I convinced Royal Vet College University of London to do my study yeah. over there as part of my course credits. And so when I got to Bwindi, it was like I'd reached the ends of the earth because it took a long time to get there. Yeah. Uh, it's about 10 hours drive from Kampala Street. At that time, we spent two nights in Kavale yeah. and continued. I was being hosted by the International Gorilla Conservation Program country director, yeah. Dr. Liz McPhee, who's also a veterinary doctor and had been working with gorillas in Rwanda. And now she had been brought to set up an NGO to carry out community conservation and gorilla tourism. And so when we got to Brindy, it was incredible. Yeah. Um, it was very remote for me. I can't imagine. I, <laughs> I stayed in a mud hut. Oh, wow. Yeah. That was the main accommodation, unless you're staying in a lodge yeah. for the first time in my life. Um, I stayed in my own hut at the top of a hill, which was quite scary yeah. because it was an open window, which never closed. Um, Dr. Liz McPhee stayed in a bigger hut down below me yeah. with a Peace Corps volunteer, Toh Hanson. And so it was really magical for me. Yeah. Um, I got to, that time there were only two habituated gorilla groups. So my research involved collecting fecal samples from their night nests and trails yeah. to check for parasites and bacteria. And so I got to do this. Liz introduced me to everybody yeah. and then left. So okay. then I had to spend almost one month on my own. But it was great for me because then I had to get to know everybody. Yeah and immerse myself with everyone. So that was really fantastic. But okay. one thing I can say is that when I, as soon as I arrived, I had a cold, so I couldn't actually go into the forest. Mm. I had to wait until I got better, which was very frustrating for me. It took me about a week oh. until I healed mm. because I could easily make the gorilla sick. So by the time I finally went in, I was like, wow, I can understand how I can impact the gorillas. Yeah. And you know, it was really nice. I got to see my first gorilla when I first saw my first gorilla. It was actually just one gorilla in the group that day. Yeah. Normally you have, they live in a family. A family, yeah. Gorillas live mm -hmm. in a family with a head male, silverback, dominant male with females and babies. But this time around, he was just on his own because the rest of the group had moved on. Mm. And he was not the dominant silverback. But once we saw him, yeah. the rangers tried to look for the other gorillas and they couldn't find them quickly. Yeah. So we just observed one gorilla that day. Okay. It was called Kachupira. Okay. Because he had Kachu. a broken hand. Kachu and so okay. I felt a very deep connection when I looked into his eyes. And I could see how we're so closely related. And actually, when you look into their eyes, you actually realize they're just extremely intelligent. He had yeah. intelligent brown eyes just staring at me, like yeah. he's trying to recognize me. And it was a wonderful experience for me. Yeah. So I felt at that point in time that they're so vulnerable. They can e we can easily make them sick. Yeah. they need to be protected and that's what got me into just becoming uganda's first wildlife vet after that okay fantastic mm -hmm. i've been to the gorillas a couple of times uh, personally mostly it's on photography and film assignments um, and each time i go to the gorillas it's it's a different experience it's exciting you see the little ones playing you see the uh, majestic silverbacks and i'd like to know um, over the years as you continue to go out to track the mountain gorillas do you still feel that same level of excitement or um is it for you are you just going to treat your patients if i could call them i'd say visiting gorillas for those who are only able to do it once it's a once in a lifetime experience but it's really magical yeah and i've been fortunate that i've been able to visit them so many times and i guess so have you with your work um, I visited them, I don't know how many times, hundreds of times. Yeah. But every single time, it's like a wonderful experience. I'm seeing something new. I'm learning something new. Yeah. And it always feels like it's, it's exciting all the time. I mean, sometimes you, you can get to the gorillas and they're in the trees. They only come down for a short time. Other times they're just there on the ground. And for me, what's also very nice for me is that I've seen them growing. Like I've seen babies become big silverbacks who head groups. Yeah. I come back and go, oh, wow, Kanyoni is really grown. Or, yeah. You know, so-and-so has really grown. And I'm like, wow, 
Yeah. And then eventually they become the silver bucks. So for me, what makes it very interesting as well is following their family histories. Then you realize, oh, where's this gorilla? Nyampazi is now transferred yeah. from Mubare to Shegura, or now she's gone back to Mubare. And that's the group dynamics. Yeah. Even sometimes you can be, you can visit gorillas in the southern sector of Buindi, and you see a gorilla that normally is supposed to be in the northern sector. They say, oh yes, they interacted in the forest. Mm -hmm. And when they interacted, this female gorilla left and she went to Nkuringo Gorilla Group. And so we get to understand their lives through all of that, which also makes it exciting. Okay. Um, about two weeks ago, I was with the gorillas, and this time around we saw a female carrying her baby. The baby was just a couple of months old, um, and she was just able to move around with the baby. I got some good video. Yeah. She was mainly in the trees. And um, a month before that, there was another female that, two months before that, there's a female I had seen, yeah. Nyampazi. They call her Nyampazi because she likes eating ants. <laughs> they met the day that I think she was born, they were eating a lot of ants. Yeah. So they called her Nyampazi, okay. which means ants in Ruchiga. Ants, yeah. So that day I saw her, she was just, you know, looking calm. Didn't look pregnant, mm. actually. <laughs> yeah. Only looked slightly different. A month later, she had had, she a, baby. had, had a baby. Went to see yeah. her, she now had a baby. Wow. And so, and the baby was quite big yeah. for that age, just a few weeks old, showing off the baby to everyone. Mm. Normally they hide them. And so, and she's not a very young female. Yeah. So, but it's nice to see all those family histories. Okay. But yeah, it's really special. Sometimes you see the Suwabak is looking after the baby. If the mother has moved away, you always see some kinds of behaviors. Yeah. But I know that when the babies are playing, it's fun it reminds me of my two sons of your two sons yeah yeah when they were <laughs> playing when they were little yeah um they like to play they like to play like children yeah. and to show off in front of the tourists or visitors um and they're curious yeah. and all of those behaviors keep remaining and keep moving on to the next generations okay the only issue now is that when i first went out gorillas would really keep away from people mm -hmm. they wouldn't get close but now they're getting too close yeah they're too habituated because those which were babies have grown up seeing humans all their lives. Mm. So they're used to just going towards humans okay. to check them out. Whereas before it wasn't the case. Yeah. So that, which isn't good for them because we can easily make them sick. Yeah. And I think we're going to have a chat about um, whether tourism is negatively impacting gorillas or gorilla conservation. I think that that, that will be something that I'd like to pick your mind on later on. Uh, but I'd like to give you a bit of a background of where, how I got to <laughs> learn about you. Um, so many years back, I worked with, a, I used to work as a safari planner with World Places Africa and the Uganda Safari Company. Okay. <laughs> the guys that run uh, a number of beautiful lodge properties, including clouds uh, in Nkuringo. And uh, in that office, I used to get quite a number of requests from clients. And they, the, uh, a couple of them wanted to track gorillas with a Dr. Gladys. And I always wondered, who was this Dr. Gladys? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then over the years, we've uh, met at conferences. We've uh, e e engaged a bit online. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how I got introduced to your story. And since then, I've been really inspired and really glued to it. Uh, but the question I'd like to ask is, uh, do you still... Uh, go out to track the gorillas with clients or um, are your trips to the forest usually, uh, if I could call it a forest ambulance to <laughs> work on the mountain gorillas? I would say the wild places are good friends of ours. Yeah. Um, I've known them even when I was working in Uga as in Uganda Wildlife Authority. Yeah. I think we did a film with Jonathan Wright for Canadian TV. Yeah. Um, I would say that I still take people to the gorillas if they would like to. Okay. In fact, I'm going to be doing something like that in September yeah. um, with a client. But yes, I, I still do it from time to time. We do have a team who can also take them okay. as well. We have some team, some of our staff are based at Windy. We have wildlife health technicians who visit all the different gorilla groups every month to collect fecal samples mm -hmm. and test them for parasites or any other emerging issues we want to look at like bacteria, viruses. We're about to start a stress hormone study yeah. with a young vet who started working with us this year um, as officially, yeah. Dr. Gloria. Last year she came as an intern okay. and she's going to be leading a study because we want to see whether tourism or human wildlife conflict 
are stressing out the gorillas and how to minimize it. Okay. And so that's going to be a very important study. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I still do. You still do. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so last year, I think at the beginning of the last year, I got the opportunity to track with uh, one of you guys, a doctor, <laughs> and I was so fascinated at how meticulous you guys are with uh, the work that you do in treating the mountain gorillas and uh, checking on them from time to time. And uh, uh, a, f a friend of mine who is a photographer in Spain, uh, when he heard that I, I had an interview with you, he asked that I ask you, uh, what challenges do you face as uh, when you go out to treat the mountain gorillas? What can you maybe help us paint an image of what usually are the challenges that you face? Um, treating mountain gorillas is tricky. Yeah. Because unlike other wild animals, they're very intelligent. The yeah. mountain gorillas and chimpanzees are very, very intelligent. We share over 98% genetic material. And so they kind of, you have to trick them. They know what you're doing. They know you're doing something funny. Mm. And so, and because they, they live in a group, the gorillas live in a family, yeah. the silverback is the person, you, the, the main gorilla you have to worry about. Mm. And so when you get to the group, you have to first identify where the silverback is yeah. before you do any intervention. And then the moment you start the intervention, you, once the particular animal is darted, the one that's sick, yeah you have to form a tent around the animal and people have to chase away the silver because of course he's going to come and attack because he wants to protect his young one. Yeah. And that is always the part where you need to have brave trackers and brave rangers. Otherwise you're gonna have, it's, you won't be able to do what you want to do. Yeah. So after you've finished everything you've done, the next problem is returning that, the particular family member back. Back to the family. Because that again yeah. he can <laughs> attack you. Yeah. So you have to kind of follow the group. Normally they would have moved on for a bit. Mm. You have to carefully carry the baby or herd the baby or, you know, the, the young gorilla towards yeah. the group and then move away slowly. No running, because the moment you run, yeah. they think you're trying to do something bad and they'll bite the nearest person. Not, it may not even be the person who ran away first, yeah. but the nearest person. Oh. And so, yeah, it's, you're dealing with very intelligent animals. So I know that sometimes when you dart them, they'll sm sniff the dart, look at it, and, and stare at you. I'm like, what are you trying to do? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas other wild animals, you know, like if it's a buffalo or other animals, giraffes, yeah. you dart one, they all run away. They just run off, yeah. Mm. And, and in fact, if you come back the next day, the one that you dart is the one that will be standing there. So that's why we have to tag them. Waiting to be darted again. <laughs> exactly. Whereas with gorillas, yeah. they have, it's a psychological thing. And it's really emotionally disturbing for them. That's why it's minimized yeah. a lot. You, it's not yet been seen ethical just to say we're going to dart gorillas just to get blood samples to see what they have. Mm -hmm. Because there's so few in number, but you only in intervene if, they're, if it's human related or life threatening. Okay. Um, I'm going to go come back to the gorillas in a bit, um, but. Uh uh, 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 just a few days ago, I saw that you won yet another award. <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I'd, uh, I, I, I'm interested in knowing as a woman in conservation, but also an African leader in conservation, um, what has it been like for you? Has it been, uh, if I could call it a smooth sail, or have there been some challenges? I would say that it's harder for women because yeah. it's a male-dominated profession, conservation. Yeah. Women are not expected to go out in the remote areas under different difficult living conditions and live there. They're not supposed to be following dangerous wild animals, you know, yeah. because sometimes you have to run, sometimes mm -hmm. you get charged. I've even had to climb trees <laughs> at some point, yeah. you know. I've had to run, I've been chased by an elephant, oh. I've been charged by gorillas. Yeah. I've had to climb trees when um, there were buffalo on the ground. I've had to do all those things. And those are considered things that men normally do, mm -hmm. not women. And so even when I first started out, there were no female rangers in Uganda Wildlife Authority, Uganda National Parks, which then became Uganda Wildlife Authority. Yeah. But I'm glad that now 20% of the rangers are female. Yeah, and that's really encouraging. Yeah. Um, and more and more female rangers are coming up. Coming up yeah. And because when they see role models, I've been inspired by Dr. Jane Goodall, who wrote the foreword for Walking with Gorillas, 
which I'm tu truly honored. Yeah. I've been inspired by the late Dr. Dan Fossi, who was the first person to do a long-term study mm -hmm. on mountain gorillas, although I never got to meet her because she was murdered yeah. before I got into conservation when I was a teenager. Um, and also Dr. Burite Gaudikas, who is the third trimet of Professor Louis Leakey, who studied orangutans. orangutans. I've met mm -hmm. her a couple of times. We, both, we were both finalists from the Indianapolis Prize for the Animal Conservation last year. Yeah. So I really got to spend a lot of time with her at that time. She's a very lovely lady. Yeah. Um, and so those three ladies have always inspired me. In fact, when I met Dr. Butte Gaudikas as a vet student in London, yeah. she wrote in, in the book I bought from her, Follow Your Dreams and the Rest Will Follow. And with Jane Goodall, when I met Dr. Jane Goodall as a vet student, I went with my sister the first time round. Mm -hmm. said, come with me. She was doing, studying in London, doing an MBA in London Business School. Yeah. And I said, there's this lady who studied chimpanzees. She's giving a talk. Can you come with me? Um, so I went with her. And Jane Goodall was very happy to see me. I was the only African. Me and my sister oh, were the wow. only Africans in the whole room wow. in London. Mm -hmm. And she said, come and visit me in Gombe. And so ever since then, I started attending many of her talks. Yeah. And so she's been following my career from when I was 23 years old, yeah. when I was a vet student. So I've been really inspired by those people, mm. um, which has helped me to continue with what I want to do, knowing that there are other women out there yeah. who are out there, who are pioneers in their field. Yeah. Um, and more so, not only are they pioneers, but they also happen to be women. Yeah. So that has been very great for me. Um, but I would say that of 10 women have to work twice as hard to be taken seriously mm. um, in the conservation field. And actually, in, I write a chapter called Women in Conservation, yeah. which both my agent, my book agent, literary agent, and the editor, who's female, both Naz Hassan and Lily Golden, who's the editor yeah. from Skyhost Publishing, are women. Wow. <laughs> and they really felt that I needed that chapter in the book because mm. I had too many chapters. They had to reduce them. Yeah. But that one, they said, is very important for women in conservation. And that was one of the most difficult chapters to write yeah. because I had to allow myself to be a lot more vulnerable to, s to all the various times that I had to recollect or come to terms with many of the times that have been put down as a woman, as a woman. Mm. in conservation. Okay. Or, or my abilities being doubted because I'm a woman in conservation. And so that was quite hard to write. Yeah. But I think it was very important because a lot of women face similar challenges. Yeah. Um, what would be your message to uh, little girls out there that I guess look up to you and would be um, hoping to be uh, Gladys, <laughs> like a, a version of yourself or a version of their own, maybe take their own journey? in conservation as well in the future. What would be your message to them? And also, as you respond to that, uh, I'd like to also know, how do we get uh, more girls, more women into conservation? Of course, you've talked about the percentage growing to 20%, uh, which is better than it was back then, but it's still, um, it, it's still not balancing, if I could say. Um, uh, what, what, what would be your thoughts on that? Um, I would say that it's still very important to have women in conservation. Um, but what I would say about that is, just like Dr. Burita said to me, follow your dream and the rest will follow. Yeah. A lot of women are under pressure as soon as they finish university. They should get married, have children, fit into the society norms. And sometimes when you're going to do such, those kind of professions, it doesn't allow you to do that straight away. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of people give up. They just follow what society expects them to do. And so they have to be willing to challenge society norms, cultural norms, to go out there to do what they want to do and mm. not get discouraged. If they really feel they want to be out there in the wild, yeah. with wildlife or living in remote areas, they, should be, they shouldn't allow anyone to discourage them. Yeah. Um, if they have to handle dangerous wild animals, they shouldn't allow anyone to discourage them. Because I know that there's a certain... A uh, woman, very dynamic woman, who yeah. I admire. She's Ugandan, and she said to me that when she met me finally through National Geographic, because we we're both National Geographic explorers, and they had a women in conservation retreat. Yeah. She said to me, "I'm so glad I finally met you in person to really talk," because she said in those early days when you were setting up the veterinary unit in Uganda Wildlife Authority, 
some of the men doubted your abilities mm -hmm. and they'll talk about me in front of her oh and they'll think who does she think she is does she think she can manage to move animals treat animals because it had never been done in uganda to treat animals and everyone there were the cynics who thought it's you should just leave wildlife on its own yeah but then they're thinking but she did also be a woman doing this because they saw that it was a very difficult thing to do yeah. and it was not normal and she said but i'm glad you proved them wrong you managed <laughs> to do all these things and show them the value of animal welfare and you know championing a new approach to conservation which where we improve the health of people and animals together yeah to promote conservation so she was really excited that i had proven them wrong oh, really? and when i look back i thought if they had shown me that they don't they doubt my abilities that time i would have been very you discouraged yeah. <laughs> but they were very polite when they would see me they wouldn't show anything and because i had a unique skill i was bringing to the table so they were like hey we need animals to be moved could you plan that yeah. when we did it successfully could you write a policy on translocation and reintroduction yeah or could you write a policy could you add veterinary component to the policy on problem animal control in Uganda, you know, yeah. animals are going to people's gardens and need to be moved. And so they they always showed me a lot of respect, but they never showed, they never told me to my face that they doubted my abilities. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really glad that they didn't, because if they had, I think it would have discouraged Should me have, a lot. Yeah. And so what I tell young women is try and be with people who are positive. Um, there'll always be people who believe in you and those who doubt you. Gravitate more towards those who believe in you because you still need to build up your confidence. Yeah. And those who doubt you, um, they'll always be there. But if they do, you should be able to speak up and challenge them. Yeah. Um, and eventually they'll realize that you're really serious. Yeah. And I'm very glad that we have a female vet, Dr. Gloria Duku, on our team. Yeah. She's doing wonderful work and she's inspired by me. When she was in my career vet school, her and her colleagues used to hear about me because they'd say, oh, there's a wildlife vet who's a female. She was the first wildlife vet and she happened to be female. You need to link up with her and get to meet her one day. So it was great when I met them, when we did a study together with Wildlife Authority and Minister of Agriculture and Uganda Virus Research Institute, looking at diseases shared by people, wildlife and livestock. Mm. And it was a proposal that we wrote together. Um, in this profession, you have to write a lot of proposals. Mm. So I was one of the main <laughs> grant writers. Yeah. And we got funding from the International Development Research Center in Canada. Okay. For, and so when we, we, did, we got this funding, I went into the field with my team. We had a, a male vet yeah. as well, also very motivated, highly motivated, yeah. Dr. Marco Cott. So he came from our team. And Dr. Gloria was an intern with the Wildlife Authority together with another vet and, and some vet technicians. Yeah. So that's when I first met them in the field. And after that, she eventually came and did an internship with us. And now she's with us. Okay. So I, I'm glad that there are more female wildlife vets coming up. It's still main, I would say maybe 20%, Yeah. still the same ratio yeah. of female wildlife vets to total wildlife vets in Uganda. Yeah. But it's not only in Uganda, all over the world. Oh. There's many more male wildlife vets mm -hmm. and female wildlife vets. But and as far as rangers goes, it's still a bit like that. But there are initiatives in Southern Africa where you have female, they're called the Black Mambas. Mm -hmm. All of them are females female rangers quite an interesting name <laughs> i know i know yeah. and there's a lady called holly who um started female ranger week so she, i'm one of her ambassadors oh nice trying to get raise the awareness about the wild female rangers mm. in the world i think i saw so I'm that proud to be one of her ambassadors yeah <laughs> i think i saw that going around on the internet just a few weeks was it a few weeks ago yes yeah okay um you, when you talked about dr Jen Goodo, uh, Dr. Dian Fossey, and um, I, f I always forget the lady that worked you on the Gaudicus. Yes, Gaudicus. Yes. Um, I, I've always thought that you share your stories. Of course, you're inspired by them, uh, but your story is so s kind of similar to them. Of course, you're all ladies, uh, but I also find it interesting that you all kind of started your journey in a small cabin at the edge of a forest. For your case, it was <laughs> <laughs> that little tent <laughs> that you talked about <laughs> earlier. Um, and uh, all of you have written books. Um, of course, you recently launched Walking with the Gorillas, which I enjoyed reading. Uh, I thought you. I knew you, but <laughs> I think reading your book, I, I got to really understand the challenges, but also uh, get a feel of this really beautiful journey that you've walked so far and continue to walk. Um, 
I'd like to, however, know whether you are inspired by any men. Because I do read that some of the earlier work around gorillas was actually done as early as the 1950s by a gentleman whose name I always forget. <laughs> I don't know if George Shala. Yes, George mm-hmm. Shala. Have you been inspired by any men along the journey? I have. I have because our our journeys have had a lot of men yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. some of them have been so supportive yeah. i'm so glad you enjoyed reading walking with gorillas um i would say that dr judge george shala i met early on in my career yeah Bef- when i went to i didn't actually meet him in person but i communicated with him yeah so after i came back from windy i wrote a report about my time with the gorillas and when i was in windy i read Gorillas in the Mist by Dr. Dan Fossey. Mm-hmm. And I also read a book that Dr. George Shala had written about working with gorillas in those early years and his first encounter in Brindy. Mm-hmm. So then I, when I wrote uh, that report, I felt I would like to share it with Professor George Shala yeah. just to see what his comments are. So I did share it with him. I sent it to him, snail mail, to New York, yeah. where he's working at the Bronx Zoo, New York Zoological Society. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, I've just been in, spent a whole month with the mountain gorillas. The, the Brindy gorillas have just been habituated and I spent a whole month with them. And I read that you visited that forest in the 50s. And he was so excited. He hand wrote back to me and said, it's so great you got to see them. Thank you for your report. I want to introduce you to the, wild, the head wildlife vet we have here, Dr. Billy Karish. Yeah. He was the first wildlife vet for the Wildlife Conservation Society. And among the first vets in America who would go around the world treating wild animals as part of the work of Wildlife Conservation Society. Yeah. So Dr. Billy Ukarish himself wrote a book called Appointments at the End of the Earth, okay. which, I, which I read when I, I was working at UWA. Yeah. So Billy Ukarish wrote to me and it was such an encouraging message. So I've, he's been somebody who has, I've really looked up to and he's always been very supportive of our work. Okay. He was support, he's, Endorsement was supposed to be on the book jacket, yeah. but he was so busy working oh. that it ended up being on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there have been a number of other male vets. There's also Dr. Richard Koch, who mm-hmm. helped me out a lot with setting up the veterinary unit. Um, he, was, he had the ability to just throw in the deep end because yeah. he thinks that's the best way to learn. <laughs> so when we're translocating elephants in Kenya, I went to learn how to translocate elephants when yeah. we had a problem in elephants destroying people's crops in Mubende. Mm. And we had to move them to either Queen Elizabeth National Park or Murchison Falls National Park. So I first went to Kenya for training. And I remember that first elephant that was darted, Dr. Cook just left me at the elephant. And then he was dropping a vet per elephant. Oh, no. And I was the youngest <laughs> on the team because yeah. the KWS vets were, I think there were four of them, one woman and three men. Yeah. And he was dropping a vet per team. But this first elephant being the first one, Everybody came yeah. to the first elephant. The media, the, the range. There were many people there. Yeah. Even those who were not necessarily going to help with the elephant, they were there. Yeah. And this elephant, and everybody was concerned that they could die because they had had a problem a few months earlier when they were translocating elephants yeah. and during the wet season, and they had diarrhea. So they thought he just told me, "Here's the drug. If the elephant is looks like it wants to die." This is the drug for waking up the elephant. Yeah. But he left me the vet box. For you to work it out. <laughs> so now yeah. the elephant put up his head. Oh. This is a big elephant, yeah. a female. She ended up being the matriarch. Oh, she put no. up her head, yeah. five ton. I was like, what? Everybody looked at me. Because in my hand, I had the drug for making her wake up if she's lose, beginning to stop breathing. Yes. So I had to look quickly in the box for the drug to make her sleep again. Mm-hmm. Everyone is looking at me. Yeah. And this is so early on in my career. Yeah. Like I'd only been working for a few months. It's properly working under pressure. Eh? <laughs> and then I finally got the, the I found the drug. Yeah. And then I thought, then I had to work out how much to give. And I thought, how much do I give? Yeah. So I thought, okay, I'm just gonna give half the dose that the elephant received. I, I had to quickly put it in the ear vein as the capture warden. Mr. Kiniji held the elephant's head down because yeah. now the elephant was ready to move. And I said, if this elephant gets up and walks away, I'll look so dumb. Yeah. I'd be so <laughs> embarrassing. So I was quickly able to put it in the vein and she went back to sleep again. Then he came back to me like half an hour later and said, how was it? I heard that uh, 
the elephant almost walked away. And I said, yeah. yeah. So where were you? I mean, I was like, <laughs> you should have come and helped me. Then he's like, no, it's good. I had you. Well done. You, you managed it. Yeah. He said, yeah, that's how you learn. I'm like, oh, that's a very <laughs> steep learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the, that's the only way. Because when we have, were moving elephants from Uvende to Queen Elizabeth, mm. there was no veterinarian with me. That, ha- that day I happened to no, no veterinary doctor could join me from Kenya. And I had to do it myself. And yeah. that was very challenging. But because I had, had been thrown in the deep end in Kenya, I'd learned to own it, take charge. So when I had to do it by myself, it was easier to do it. So yeah. there have been a lot of um, male mentors. Yeah. But I have to talk about a primatologist, male mentor, yeah. who has been like a father to me, Professor Vernon Reynolds. Yeah. He's, um, he gave me an opportunity to first study ch- primates in the wild, which is chimpanzees in Budongo Forest. Mm. When he, when he gave a talk in London Zoo, and I went up to him showing him, I had spent a week at Ntebe Zoo looking after orphan chimpanzees, yeah. supported by Jenguru Institute. So he said, and I said, I want, to, I even when I still couldn't go to study gorillas then, because I'm not yet habituated for tourism in Buindi, yeah. in tourism site, he said, come to Budongo. And so he's always been mentoring me from that time, taught me how to write a scientific report, mm. um, taught me so many things. Um, and all my life he's been a mentor and an advisor and up to now he still is okay. and so yeah there have been many people who have been very supportive and he has he's been among those who have encouraged me when others were discouraging me yeah so yeah he's a very famous primatologist okay he was the first person to study chimp- chimpanzees in uganda oh in the 1960s I yeah 60s. and he went out the same time as dr jane Goodall. yeah but he um he went he, he got a grant from Royal Geographic Society yeah. and Dr. Jinguro got a grant from National Geographic Society and his grant ran out before hers. Mm. So he went and became a professor in Oxford and he came with his wife, Frankie Reynolds, who sadly passed away oh, a couple of weeks ago, which is very sad because they've been companions for so long. And she was also a very great supporter of my work and my mother's work, my mother's work as well. She encouraged mm. my mom to write her book. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, 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 we'll come and talk about your mother and your dad in a bit. Um, but as you were talking about the translocations you did with the elephants and the work you've done with the chimpanzees, uh, most people listening in might not know. <laughs> of course, some of us know because we've read the book. Um, but most people know you as the gorilla lady, if I could say. Um, but you've done work, as you've already told us, around other species. Uh, the chimpanzees did stand out for me because just a few a few months ago we were in Chambura filming uh, an episode called Lost Chimpanzees <laughs> of Chambura and they are quite so interesting characters like all of them they, they, they hit, they bang the trees they, they, they make these interesting pant hoods uh, it's, it's, it's such a show when you are down there I'd like to know, do you still do any work with any other species right now, apart from the mountain gorillas? Yes, we do. Um, We do do other work with other species. Um, We, being a wildlife veterinarian, I should be able to treat any animal, and I still do, even the regular domestic dogs and cats. Um, Recently, our vet, Dr. Gloria, went to assist at the Ngamba Chimpanzee Island Sanctuary Mm. when they were doing the annual health checks. Yeah. My namesake Kalema is there because I rescued him yeah. near Budongo Forest, yeah. and he's the one of the main, the alpha males, but second in command. Yeah, and I, I would say the most handsome. <laughs> 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 Not because I rescued him; yeah. he's the calmest and most handsome chimp there. Yeah. Um, so yes, we still do work with chimpanzees if we are called upon. Mm. Shambura Gorge is really beautiful. Um, I say it's not always easy to see the chimpanzees there, but when you get to see them, yeah. it's really nice. They are different from the others because they're stuck kind of in a gorge. Mm-hmm. They're not like Budongo where you see so many because they're about over 500 in Budongo Forest yeah. and over 1,000 in Kibale National Park. In Shambura, it's a bit different mm-hmm. um, because they are kind of, they now need to connect with another group of chimpanzees, another community mm-hmm. further ahead, I think from the forest reserve. And they are really stuck there. Yeah. So they're really struggling. But they're very intelligent animals. And yeah, it's, it's sad that they're kind of stuck there. I think the best thing to do is get a corridor to connect them 
to the forest reserve. To, to other forest, I know that Volcano mm -hmm. Safaris has done a lot of work there. Mm -hmm. They have a lodge and they take people to see the chimpanzees there. Yeah. Um, the Wildlife Authority also do. When I was working in Uwa, mm. we used to sometimes go and check on them down there. Um, they're very special and I think they also need a lot of support. Yeah. And the community around also needs a lot of support so they can coexist with these chimpanzees. Yeah. But I think the best thing for them is to connect them to the other ones and create a corridor. Great, yeah. And whether people are willing to move away for that corridor to happen requires a lot of community sensitization, awareness, and ownership yeah. of these chimpanzees. So yeah. that's still quite a lot of work to be done by yeah. the local partners in the area. Yeah. Um, we also sometimes collect, you know, as I mentioned, we collect samples from other savanna species mm. to, s to look at diseases that they could be sharing with livestock, which could go to people like brucellosis, Rift Valley fever. Um, so like, you know, buffalo, zebras, waterbuck, okay. Uganda cob, all kinds of species, warthogs. So we still continue to sometimes work with these other species from time to time. Yeah. In nice. various national parks. Nice, fantastic. When I was reading your book, I I, I also did realize that uh, the the giraffes in Kidepo, you have a hand in that. And every time I get to film them, I'm, I'm excited. I didn't know that you I, until I read the book. I didn't know that you were responsible for bringing in. Was it uh, was they four or five from Kenya? We, we brought in three giraffes three from giraffes. Kenya. Yeah. Um, Kidepo was down to one female. Yeah. And five males. So if anything happened to that female, it would be the end of giraffes in Kidepo. Yeah. So one of the first things I was, first assignments I was given by Dr. Edroma, another person who I really admire yeah. and has totally, he made the difference for my life because he took me on as mm. a young female vet doctor and said, I want you to come. Because I wrote to him and I said, this is what a vet does after Bwindi. Um, you need a vet. I've spent a month in Windy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is what a vet, a wildlife vet does. Can you hire me as your first wildlife vet? And he did. Yeah. He took a chance on me. Although he got a criticism from people saying, how can you hire someone like that? She's a young vet fresh out of university. She's a woman. He said, no, she's determined. I know she, we can, she'll be able to help us. And he did. Mm -hmm. He was very, 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 very supportive from day one. He's one of the most supportive people in my career. And so Dr. Droma, because he believed in me so much, he said, I want you to move elephants. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, I've been used to moving cats and dogs, but yeah. five-ton animals. And so I got training in Kenya Wildlife Service. Then the giraffes, we found out that they had too many in Lake Nakuru. They were debunking all the trees. Mm. And Kidepo had too few. So then we had to arrange. We couldn't bring them from Murchison because there were a lot of Kony rebels in that area. And they also had a skin disease, which is mm. also the, one of the first cases I had to look at. So we had the safest was Kenya where they also want to get rid of them. So we organized with P Peter Muller, who was a warden engineer in Kidepo. He raised the money from Frankfurt Zoological Society. And it was a big operation to yeah. move these three giraffes. We wanted to move, bring about five or six. The letter actually gave permission to bring six giraffes. But when we went to Kenya, there were very few young giraffes mm. that could fly in a military Hercules standing. Because they had to fly wow. standing mm. when they're wide awake. Because it's a long journey. Giraffes can't stay down for a long time, like ele unlike elephants. Yeah. Giraffes have to be reversed within 30 minutes. Oh. Otherwise, you lose them. So we had to fly them standing. After they were darted and reversed, put in a boma for some weeks. Yeah. They get used to people. We had to then put them in within their crates into the, heli into the military Hercules aeroplane. And so there were only three that were small enough, below yeah. three meters in height. Yeah. And they were only between the ages of nine months to one year. Can you imagine? Wow. They were still very young. So we flew them to Kidepo, and we could only find two females and one male. So I named the female Nakuru, Kenya, and mm. Hercules. <laughs> so when we got there, yeah. and we released them with a very, very warm welcome from the park staff. Yeah. The chief warden was Angelo Ajoka. Um, it was actually all filmed by BBC. Wow. All of it. So it's. Is this still somewhere that we can find it and watch it? Very much so. Okay, you can. Yeah. Um, very much so. Yeah. You can find it. And uh, when we got there and we released them, um, they, they were. The, the big female that was older yeah. was the most nervous all through the journey. 
So she collapsed and I had to put her head up and everything because now I was no longer with the Kenya Life Service Vets. Yeah. The head vet at the last moment said he forgot his passport. Oh no. I don't know if it was <laughs> deliberate or not, but yeah. he was not able to accompany me to Uganda. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be by myself. So I was by myself in the, hell, in the Hercules with two rangers I brought from Kidepo and Peter Muller. Yeah. So when we got there, we released them. They stayed in the Boma for six weeks. Then afterwards, they we got them. We got they drove the other six giraffes to meet these three, mm. and they met them. And because they were babies, they accepted them, and that was really beautiful. They joined the the wild herd. Yeah. Um. Sadly, six weeks later, Hercules got eaten by a lion. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> very well. expensive meal. <laughs> yeah. I was very upset when I had it, but luckily he was male because we needed females. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then a few weeks after that, the, they called me and said that the female, that adult female is having difficulties. Looks like she's trying to give birth mm. and she's having difficulties. So we flew to Kidepo. It was very dangerous to drive. So we flew. And when we got there, we found that she had just died giving birth to a baby girl. Oh. Can you imagine? So we lost that. We lost her. But then those two females who remained from Kenya, yeah, they really bred with the males. It's not a regular two females and more males. Yeah. But they bred and bred and bred. So when I went back as a board member of Uganda Wildlife Authority in 2012, mm. 15 years after the translocation, I s we they showed me the, how where the giraffes were. They had risen to over 35. Wow. I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> so excited. And the some of those rangers, the two rangers were still there. Oh. They were now senior. One of them was now working for Wild Places, actually, at yeah. the lodge. And he was so happy to see me. Yeah. And because during that time, there was a book uh, where I was a co-author called Gladys working as a wildlife vet. Mm. I even gave him a copy of the book because he was inside there, his photograph. He was so happy. Because yeah. they took, when we were moving the giraffes, and then later on, they moved some giraffes from Murchison and they went up to over 50. So I can say that that single translocation of just two females in the end that yeah. survived brought the giraffes in Kidepo back from the brink of extinction. So because even at the time, people were like, why should you remove animals, etc.? It's a lot of money. Yeah. But that showed the value of translocation. Yeah. Once you provide them safety, once they're there, then it's fine. Yeah. So I'm very, giraffe, I think, are one of my favorite savannah species, I, I have I, to say. I, I love them as well. <laughs> <laughs> They're very graceful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll come back to a question on uh, a type of conservation that that uh, I think my, my engagement with uh, quite a number of people at the Wildlife Authority is they want a type of conservation that is a no-touch, like let nature fend for itself. Um, and I think as someone who is... I guess the work that you do involves really uh, engaging a lot with the wildlife and helping it survive, if I could use that as a phrase. I, I, I'll want to pick your mind on that uh, later on, but let me just come back home a bit and ask, your dad is or was uh, a very celebrated politician. Yes. And, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. and uh, so is your mom as well. Uh, I'd like to know, did the journey or the first steps they took, did, did those inspire you in any way to uh, become a leader in, in your own discipline? Not really a politician, but <laughs> uh, a leader in conservation. Did they, did they inspire you in any way? They did. Um, my dad, <laughs> yeah. who sadly I don't remember because he died when I was two years old, mm -hmm. um, was one of the first ministers in Uganda in the first government after independence when Uganda attained independence in 1962 yeah prior to that he had been in the Buganda government um, and then he was made a minister under Obote one mm. and so he did a lot for the country and because he was a minister of works and housing works and communications they always used to um, President Obote always used to send him to lead goodwill missions he used to like leading, sending him. So he went to India, he went to China, all these places. They went to the Far East during that time. Yeah. Because having gained independence from the British, they wanted to now go to the East, and the Eastern side of the world, yeah. to seek support. So I remember the late Honorable Etiang told me how 
when we were opening a certain road where my dad and mom built a house in Muyenga. Mm. It was the first house built there in those days. So they, they finally named it after my dad, William Kalema Drive. So when they were opening that drive, I learned so much about him because Honorable Etiang said he was, in, he was in the delegation that my dad led. They went to different places. But he said he used to like shopping for Uganda. Yeah. So they went to China, shopped for Mandela Stadium. It was supposed to be called, it was supposed to be given for free. Mm. But then when we had so many other government changes, now it became a loan to Uganda because it's going to be the first stadium built, that China built in Africa. Yeah. Um, they shopped for so many things. So roti meat packers from different places, Busita Marai scheme from Yugoslavia. So it was really nice. So when we celebrated 50 years since he, remembering him, 50 years since he disappeared, yeah. he was one of the first victims killed by Idi Amin oh, no. when Idi Amin came into power. I compiled this booklet and that was my contribution. I said, I'm going to compile the booklet. I didn't get involved in the, part, in the event, yeah. but that was my contribution. And so this booklet talks about his life. And I learned more compiling this booklet than I'd learned all these years yeah. since he died. Wow. I learned so much about him. Going to the Far East, heading the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, and so many things that he did. And so he was, yeah, he was a very special person. But when I found out later in life that, you know, you, you had a father, but he was killed by Idi Amin, you know, as a child when I grew up and asked, do I have a dad? Yes, where, where is he? They said he was killed by Idi Amin. I wanted to, f I felt strongly that I wanted to continue his legacy yeah. of a prosperous Uganda, yeah. but through my passion for wildlife. And so I did. And my mom actually, she's somebody who, um, also got influenced to join politics because of my dad yeah. so both her and him they joined uganda people's congress upc mm -hmm. in those early days of the 60s and when he was killed obviously she had to go down you know she, she didn't get involved in politics at all but when president museveni came into power she said she wanted to now join politics to continue his legacy so she did and she was one of the first female politicians in uganda and she eventually wrote her autobiography oh, in 2021 nice. <laughs> about her life, you know, growing up in Uganda, yeah. Uganda as a Muganda woman, and going to King's College Budo, yeah. uh, which was a male-dominated school, but her dad felt he wanted to take his girls there. It was pr primarily boys. And she talks about all that she's been through as one of the first female politicians and encouraging other women yeah. um, to go through, you know, to become, to lead to become politicians in their area, which has really helped. Because of her and others like Honorable Mar Maria Matembe and Honorable Winnie Bianyima, mm. when she was in parliament in those days, they had they advocated for an extra female seat in parliament. So actually, Winnie Bianyima actually wrote um, an endorsement on her book. Oh, nice. So And they gave her an award very early on, when I was at Ua, I remember, yeah. from Fawade. Forum for Women in Democracy. Yeah. She got the first Forward Day Award in Uganda. Wow. Um, so she's been a great inspiration. She's always allowed me to do what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she, yeah, she's, so when I wanted to work with animals, she was like, no, let her do what she wants. Yeah. I Even mean, if it doesn't earn a lot of money, I, I, when I leave this world, I want her to feel that she did what she wants to do. Yeah. And she's passionate about what she wants to do. Yeah. So I was very lucky that she didn't, she wasn't one of those parents who force you into this, that, or the other. Yeah. You know, they were like, why don't you do human medicine? Because if you want to treat animals, you might as well treat people. Yeah. I'm like, I don't, I, I hate seeing animals suffering. I don't get energized when I go to Mulago Hospital. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I get depressed with all those sick people around, but I want to help animals. Yeah. And so my mom really understood it because she saw the passion when I was a child. When any of our dogs got sick or cats, I would miss school. Yeah. Until she would, and I would go with her to the vets in Wandegea. Yeah. And yet I was a kid who liked school. Yeah. So... So she's always encouraged me. I think but I, but yeah. when it came to the gorillas, she was a bit concerned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, th I think it's good. It's always good to have that supportive parent. Of course, I know you, unfortunately, your dad, you didn't get to see him. But I think uh, your mother, just hearing you speak, it's always nice to have, um, yeah, really a supporting parent, especially when you are pioneering and really going into a journey that not no one else has taken. I don't know if that was because you were the youngest of six, so you got all the love. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I, I think, I, I think really that it's kudos to her for having uh, 
let you let you f- fly your wings and and, and here we are now just in listening to your beautiful story um if i could remember when i was reading your book i ha- i i read that your mother you led your mother to her first gorilla trek but one thing that really stood out for me and of course not to give away too much for those that have not read the book is that she tracked the gorillas in quite unique fashion in a skirt <laughs> which i tried to envision <laughs> was quite uh, quite quite interesting um was that for you your mama i made it moment where you got to bring her into the forest uh, your workplace Do you, would you say that was your that moment where you were so proud <laughs> yes yeah. i really say because my mom you know really supports me so she tries to get involved in my work she's a hands on mother yeah um also a hands on grandmother actually when we had children all her grandchildren yeah. are very very close to jaja yeah. because she's a hands on mother and a hands on grandmother and so when it, we went to she didn't want me to study the gorillas she said uh uh-uh. uh mm. those the, i can't allow you to go to the gorillas they will kill you or more you <laughs> yeah. i said no cuz king kong gives them a bad name hollywood yeah. all of that but then eventually mary clopper who's another lady who's really supported me convinced my mom that no 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 it should be fine so when i finally got to study the gorillas and then i was fin- finishing my time at uwa i had got an opportunity now to go abroad and do a zoo medicine residency mm-hmm. and so i felt like maybe i should um, bring mama to the gorillas because she was beginning to start having health issues. So I said let me bring t- her to them before she doesn't she's not able to visit them because yeah. she can't hike those hills. So I brought her to the gorilla. She was with my aunt, Mrs. Rita Chiwana, Auntie Rita Chiwana and her sister-in-law. And so when we were going to the gorillas, I asked my mom what she's going to wear. She just said like, she was wearing a skirt. Yeah. I said you don't have trousers? Cuz no. I said, "Eh." Uh. <laughs> My auntie Rita had trousers at least. Yeah. So yes, she tracked gorillas in a skirt and the people they they took us to the nearest group. Yeah. And everybody walked extra slowly to make sure she makes it. And the uh, people who were digging tea in the fields to the way to, on the way to the gorillas were fascinated to see her with us. Yeah. They're saying, "Hey, Mukaikuru, old lady, what are you doing going to see the gorillas?" Mm. You know? They had never seen an old African woman yeah. going to visit gorillas, an elderly African woman. Yeah. And they were so excited to see her. So after the gor- when we went to the gorillas, she's like, "Ah. Oh, they're just gentle vegetarians living in a big salad bowl. <laughs> just getting, you know, and she was really charmed by them." Yeah. Of course my sister and brother who when they went to visit they were 4 hours away they said I think you brought the gorilla specially close for her <laughs> how come us we had to walk we so to far walk, yeah. you know my brother Dr William Kalema my sister Dr Veronica Kalema mm. um but anyway when we got back home when we got back to the camp the women brought their crafts they were so excited to see her that they came they never ever come to me like that but they came and brought their crafts they wanted to talk to her they thought they wanted to talk to someone like her and talk to her about their lives and their challenges they were so welcoming so that was very special to see yeah. they really wanted to meet her yeah. uh, the local communities and later on of course i started to work very closely with them yeah. but it was really nice that they warmed up to her having seen her walking with me to the forest yeah Yeah, nice. the rangers everybody was walking extra slowly even the tourists yeah. they were like ah this is a very important person She's yeah. the mother of Dr. Gladys. Let's make sure she gets to she see gets the gorillas. See yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're only about 45 minutes away. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Um I I like that you are getting your little boys into the thick of things already. <laughs> um and one thing that I also find interesting each time I listen to your story is that you learned child spacing from the mountain gorillas <laughs> <laughs> which is quite intriguing for me. Um I'd like to know are there any other lessons that we can learn from mountain gorillas as you learned child spacing I learned child spacing from them yeah. <laughs> They have a baby once every four and a half years Yeah um by the time they have the second child the older one is old enough to build his own nest um and help to babysit the younger one which is very logical yeah. and also they're not emotionally as dependent on the parent they have different emotional needs mm. and i think with human beings is exactly the same 
So when Indigo, when Tendo was born, four and a half years after Indigo, Indigo could even carry his baby brother, oh. play with him. It was a different emotional need. Yeah. And I think that was really, I learned that from the gorillas and the chimpanzees, actually. Yeah. They're also the same. I've learned so much. They're very good mothers, um, I have to say. Mm. They really look after their young ones for four years. They breastfeed for three years, exclusive breastfeeding. Yeah. Um, so without modern contraceptive, they're able to. And that's what human beings should do. They're very motherly. They're, they really look after their, their babies. Mm. Um, so I've learned things like that, how to be a better mother from the gorillas. Okay. Cool. So for anyone listening, you might hear some planes flying by. That's just because we're out <laughs> here in Entebbe. <laughs> You're not so far away from the airport. Um, and thank you for joining us for this really insightful conversation on uh, gorilla conservation and, uh, and also this incredible journey that Dr. Gladys Kalema has walked. Now, Doctor, you've also led uh, a number of celebrities uh, to the gorillas. I did hear that you've led uh, Her Royal Highness, the Queen Nabagedeka of Buganda, uh, to the gorillas. And um, I think I also heard that the gentleman that invented the World Wild Web, as we know it, uh, you guys led him there. Um, I'd like to know what or what, what, how, why is it important that we get cultural leaders, celebrities, um, and if I could call them public figures, to pick interest in conservation, not just for the gorillas alone. It was so exciting to take the Queen of Buganda, the Navagirika, to the gorillas. Yeah. She done, it ended up being that she was the first queen in the world to track the mountain gorillas. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that was so exciting when we launched the programs. My husband is a founder member of Conservation Through Public Health. And we went together with him to convince her to become the patron. In that oh. We met her in her office in Bulange. Nice. And she was, and she said, when I'm a patron of a charity, I always get involved. I don't want to just be a figurehead. Yeah. So when we were launching the programs, we invited her to Bwindi. And it was very, very exciting. Mm. Um, and it, I, we felt that it got Ugandans to feel that gorilla trekking is not a, just an experience for foreigners. It's an experience for all of us. If the Queen of Buganda can go, so can the other rest of the Baganda, so can the rest of the country. Yeah. And even when we were there, the Batwa, they really wanted to meet her. They told her they want to meet the Kabaka. <laughs> they were just so excited to see her as yeah. a cultural leader. And the LC, local LC5 chairperson and all of those, the RDC, Canon Ben Rulonga, they were so excited to see her. Mm. And that made, it raised the profile of gorilla trekking within Uganda and made people feel that this is for us. Yeah. It's not just for foreigners. We have to be proud of this heritage. Bringing Satim Bernice Lee, it's actually my husband who led him to the gorillas because my husband's a telecom specialist. Um, Lauren Zixoka did his master's in telecom. Yeah. And he, through his networks, he got to know about Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web, and convinced him to come to Uganda to yeah. visit the gorillas and support the telecommunication projects. Because Lawrence helped to set up the telecenter at Bwindi, and we also set up one at Queen Elizabeth National Park. Yeah. So the one at Bwindi kind of stopped when everyone now got phones and there was network. But when Sir Tim Berners-Lee came to Uganda, the Queen Elizabeth one was still there, and it still is. Yeah. So he took him to Queen Elizabeth, then took him to Bwindi. And again, that raised the profile of why it's important to protect wildlife, because he has a huge network, even beyond our networks. So bringing public figures enables us to reach people outside the conservation community yeah. and get them to feel that it's important to visit these animals, protect them, protect wildlife. And so it's really, really important to bring such high profile people okay. to such places. Okay, fantastic. Now. Um, let's now talk about conservation through public health. Um, I like that the idea of how this whole entity was to come together uh, was hatched by a solution that the community offered, if I got that right. Yes. Um, in one of the meetings that you had in uh, one of the villages close to the mountain gorillas, the communities themselves stood up and told you what exactly they wanted. I'd like to know as uh, 
leader in conservation and someone who has been in conservation for so many years, how do we um, get this model of allowing the communities to provide their solutions to uh, the problems that our natural world faces as opposed to bringing them in as stakeholders and consulting them in quotes, if I could say, uh, wh how do we get to learn from a model like yours to now ensure that all these other problems that we face all across the African continent, not just Uganda alone, um, can be solved in a similar fashion? Because I believe that the communities living next to these uh, wild places where the wildlife roams naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I want to get the feeling that they know how to solve some of the challenges that we have. Um, how, how do we get many more uh, communities to, if I could say, take that leading seat to provide the solutions? I would say that, um, yes, in the book I talked about, um, I, t I did talk a lot about how I was shocked that the community knew what they wanted. Yeah. Because you you tend up to be taught that these people are, you know, these people are poor, so they don't really know what they need. Yeah. But when we have the health education workshops with the local communities, when everybody felt I should lead them, being the only vet in the organization, when people made gorillas sick, people gave gorillas scabies. Yeah. And the baby gorilla died and we were able to treat the rest with ivermectin and they got better. And everyone thought, we're going to get another scabies outbreak if we don't improve the health of the communities. So they asked me to lead health education workshops. Sure enough, we did get another scabies outbreak, yeah. but now we had started to engage them. And so when we, I told them what the problem was, how they got sick, I was about to tell them the solution because I'd already got it written down. Yeah. And the ranger touched my arm and said, let's hear what they have to say, the community conservation ranger. And they came up with much better suggestions than I was proposing for them. And I was like, wow. So a lot of them are, is what we used to start the NGO. Yeah. So in fact, this book is divided into a section on becoming a conservationist, then becoming a wildlife veterinarian, then One Health. That's when my One Health journey began, and then sustaining conservation. So all of that came about as a result of meeting with these communities. Yeah. It was a turning point in my life. They proposed how they can prevent gorillas getting sick. You know, they, they one of their main things they said is they want continuous health education. It shouldn't just be a one-off. Yeah. You know, then, you know, about not openly defecating, covering rubbish heaps, not leaving dirty clothing around. That's how the gorillas got sick. Then they also said that they wanted to strengthen the human gorilla conflict team that had gorillas back when they come out, the Hugos. And then they said that they also wanted health services to be brought closer to them. Yeah. I was like, whoa, I didn't realize they live so far away from the nearest health center. Yeah. So when I went to America to study, to do the masters and the zoo medicine residency, I had all of that in the back of my mind that why don't we start an NGO that does just this? Yeah. And so even as we're engaging them, our organization has, is yes, we have a staff of over 40 now, including the social enterprises, yeah. but we have 10 times as many community members we work with mm. within Bwindi alone, just Bwindi Penetrable National Park. Yeah. So we have like 430 village health and conservation team members, maybe over 20 community conservation animal health workers. Yeah. And we work so closely with these people. They're community volunteers, but they promote good health and hygiene. They promote family planning, where it's important to space your children, how to access contraceptives. They talk about sustainable agriculture, mm -hmm. um, livelihoods, you know, having a food crop garden. They do some, they talk about so many things and how to access money from gorilla ecotourism and how to reduce human wildlife conflict. So whenever homes are visited by gorillas and baboons and other wildlife, they alert the human gorilla conflict team, the gorilla guardians, yeah. to herd them back. And we have, of them, 50% are women and 50% are men. Oh. I'm so glad that through our work, yeah. we're engaging women equitably, local communities equitably in conservation, yeah. both women and men. We bring about gender equality. It's yeah. not something that we planned out to do. We're not intentional about it. Yeah. But because healthcare is the domain of women and conservation is the domain of men, we're able to get half half. We get men more involved in healthcare and family planning, mm -hmm. and women more involved in conservation and natural resource management. Another approach, it's called a One Health approach, but it's also called population health environment. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's been really exciting. And we have meetings with them, and we talk, we talk to them about issues. They keep proposing things. 
for example, they proposed how we can maintain them. We were going to hold another workshop the first time we started to engage them through family planning. Yeah. When USAID gave us funding through um, an organization in US, Camp Dresser Maki International, and we were about to give them more money for another workshop, and they said, we want livestock because we are volunteers and we want to keep doing this work. Mm -hmm. We don't get a salary. So luckily, our third founder member, Mr. Stephen Rubanga, kind of said to me that he had worked in means of agriculture for 20 years. He said, instead of giving them individual goats or cows, which they may or may not look after properly, yeah. depending on how good they are at farming, let's bring it, let's make it a group activity which brings them together. So it will be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. They're more likely to earn from it. And it keep, and they will keep going. So we did. And there was, but they're the ones who proposed. So one group asked for goats, another group asked for cows. And we haven't had dropouts over the past, it's now coming to 18 years. Wow. Yeah, since 19, we started in 2007. Yeah. Over the past 17 years, we've not had dropouts. And so this is in, in, for that particular group. And it keeps growing and growing. Yeah. So that's something that we're very excited about. And we continue to make sure that with communities, don't impose your ideas on them. You can talk to them about the problems, yeah. but it's very important that they come up with a solution yeah. because then they'll own it. Yeah. And normally they know better, they have a better solutions than what you're proposing for them. Yeah. Yeah. We, s we, we always think that we have all the answers to every, <laughs> every problem. And <laughs> I think, as you say, it's always nice that uh, the people that are most affected by um, living around these world spaces yes. be the ones to offer the solutions to the yes. problems. Yeah. But one thing I've also enjoyed is that when we went out to do the health education workshops, I was leading the team because mm. I developed all the brochures with a designer in Kampala. I was the team leader, bringing the information. That time it was a One Health team. We didn't, it wasn't coined One Health yet, yeah. but they had a veterinarian, community conservation ranger and warden, more like social scientists and conservationists. And we also had a public health person, the yeah. sub-county health assistant, Robert Sajabi. So when we went there, they, the, the ranger said to me, hey, women are whispering in Richiga. You uh, have to educate their girl child. Because I was a woman leading a team of men. They were seeing me standing up, yeah. a young woman leading a team of men. They were like, we have to educate our daughters. And I'm glad that through our approach, women stand up, give talks in their community. We're seeing more and more girls coming up. Yeah. More and more girls wanting to even do male things, like play football, not only netball. Nice. <laughs> but then they... Some of them are saying, I want to become a ranger or I'm now going to, I want to work in tourism. So we're getting more and more girl, young girls coming up in the communities who want to do conservation related work, yeah. which is very exciting. Fantastic. Now you also now have um, Gorilla Conservation Coffee, uh, which um, I've, I've read that is quite a very well celebrated brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, tell us a bit about how that began and also where is it now and where can people find it? Uh, tell us a bit about Gorilla Conservation Coffee. Gorilla Conservation Coffee is, we, we founded this social enterprise in 2015. Whenever I would go to visit the gorillas, I often cross coffee farms and we found out that those farmers were not getting a fair market mm -hmm. or a steady price. So they're still entering the forest to poach the daika, the bush pig, and collect firewood. And because if they wanted meat, they couldn't sell their coffee to buy meat because yeah. they weren't getting a good price for their coffee. It was easier for them to just go and hunt the animals in the park. So my husband said to me that why don't we start a global coffee brand to save gorillas through coffee, one sip at a time through nice. coffee. Creative. And so that's how we, it started. Yeah. And luckily we found that the windy coffee is very delicious because it's grown at a high altitude yeah. um, for Arabica, because we're growing, focusing on Arabica. Um, it grows at a high altitude, the soils are perfect. They have some volcanic nature to them and all of that produces very good coffee. Yeah. And so it, that helped because the first customer may come because they want to help gorillas, but they won't come back for a repeat cup of coffee if it doesn't taste good. So we were excited when Coffee Review reviewed it as the top 30 coffees in the world in California, yeah. it was number 29 wow. out of number 30. Wow. <laughs> and we knew that if we have a, f we worked with a coffee expert, Peter Binu, yeah. who Uganda Coffee Development Authority referred to us. He's fantastic. 
because he got a very good sample, which we sent to California. So now we're getting all the farmers to be like that. Um, and it's really helped to complement what we're doing because it's helped to strengthen our livelihood program very much mm -hmm. within CTPH, but it's, a own, it's its own social enterprise. So it's a company, for-profit company, limited by shareholding, because we want to attract impact investors. Okay. And so it's called a hybrid. We have an NGO plus a business together. Yeah. It's called a hybrid. Okay. Um, and it's been really exciting because we give the farmers above market price only for good coffee. We only buy good coffee from them. Mm. And the bad coffee, they take back and sell to someone else. So they know if they do things properly, they pick yeah. the coffee at the right time. They'll get more. <laughs> they'll produce good coffee. Yeah. Because they can. All of them can produce. All their coffee can be good. Yeah. But they just have to follow the right processes in growing it, in processing it. Yeah. And we help them with all of that. And so once they sell it to us, some of it is premium, some of it is specialty. Like the 92 points is specialty coffee. Mm. Premium starts from 85 upwards. Specialty is from 90 upwards. So we are able to... Um, be able to sell it at a very high price because and we sell it to tourists who are visiting uganda they meet these farmers and they want to support them yeah a lot of tourists now are conscious travelers they really want to feel like they're helping wherever they go yeah so they don't only want to visit gorillas and other wildlife they want to help the communities and if they've met them and they know oh this coffee is from the communities would rather drink it than just any old coffee in a supermarket we don't know where it's from yeah. so this coffee is very popular in the lodges around Bwindi because they can say this coffee is supporting local farmers. In fact, our biggest customer at the beginning was the community lodge built mm. by the Bwindi community, Heaven oh, Lodge, wow. because mm. we were supporting their own farmers yeah. and they were very happy. And so those are our main customers, but we also get anyone flying out of the airport when they go to Entebbe Duty Free Transit Shop, mm. it's the coffee that they prefer to buy because it's very well branded with my favorite Gorilla <laughs> Kanyonyi, yeah. who I knew since he was a baby yeah. and operated on his older sister when she had a rectal prolapse. Yeah. And so everybody likes to buy the coffee. They like the story, they like the branding, mm -hmm. and they like the taste. But we also have Ugandans are beginning to drink coffee. Yeah. Yes, we are the largest coffee producing country in the world, even more than Ethiopia, if you add Robusta. Oh, wow. But yeah. we don't market ourselves well enough. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't drink our coffee. <laughs> Ethiopians <laughs> drink their coffee. Yeah. So Uganda Coffee Development Authority is a key partner because we're helping to market Ugandan coffee. Because when people s hear Gorilla Conservation Coffee, they know gorillas are in Uganda, so this coffee must be from Uganda. Yeah. So they love that we're helping people to know Uganda has good coffee. And that's really nice. Um, we, so we have customers also in Europe, in UK, America, mm -hmm. New Zealand, Australia, Canada. Many people want to buy the coffee. Yeah. So we have distributors in UK. USA, we had distributors, now we're working with, the f we're gonna work with a fulfillment company, but people are addicted to it. Yeah. They keep calling me, your coffee is the best. When can we get to drink it? They keep sending me messages yeah. from America. So, um, and other places. New Zealand as well, we have a buyer there yeah. who buys coffee and he takes ours. And we, what we do is we make sure they co-brand so everyone knows the coffee is from Buindi. Okay. Because that's another problem with coffee. It gets lost along the value chain. It gets mm. mixed with other coffees. People don't know where it's from. And if they know where it's from, it's now called traceability. It has more meaning for them. You can even charge people more highly. Okay. So we're within that. We they call them lifestyle of health and sustainability consumers. People who want to. They, when they drink something or eat something or buy something, they say, was it done properly, ethically? Yeah. What, did the people suffer? Mm. Did they get a good price? Were the animals protected? Was the environment not destroyed? I those are our main customers, and those are growing all over the world. Yeah. And so we have all of those, plus the growing number of coffee drinking Ugandans. We have a Gorilla Conservation Cafe in Entebbe, yes. which I hope you get to visit. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I suppose to have the interview there, but it was a bit noisy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in that cafe, we only serve coffee from the farmers around Windy. Okay. Only Windy. Um, and our dream is, you know, to only serve coffee from any farmers around gorilla habitats. Okay. at the gorilla conservation cafes nice. and so we have one there we're trying at queen elizabeth national park we have a small cafe together with the wildlife authority again we serve the coffee there mm. and at Bwindi we have a gorilla conservation camp where we also serve the coffee there so those are the places where we have the gorilla conservation cafes within uganda and we're hoping that in other countries we could have them as well okay and a donation from every bag sold goes to support is put aside 
to support the work of conservation through public health, okay. improving community health, gorilla health, yeah. and conservation education. So in that process, we're producing sustainable financing for conservation. Yeah. Um, and we got our first loan from the World Wildlife Fund Switzerland in our program that they developed to provide sustainable financing for conservation. Okay. It's called an impact investment for conservation program. Okay. And that really helped to get the business off the ground. Yeah. Fantastic. And I like I like that the world is as you said, people are being a bit more careful about what they consume. They want to know where it's coming from, how it's made, as you said. Even that the gadgets that we run around with, I see people raise questions about where phones are made, <laughs> whether there is <laughs> Uh, uh, Cold time, yes, yeah. like in DRC. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I like that all the work you do is evolving around really improving livelihoods, especially in those uh, host communities that need it the most. Now, as we head towards the end of the conversation, I'd like to bring back the discussion of whether gorilla tourism is hurting mountain gorillas. Um, last year was I believe 30 years since mountain gorilla tourism began um, and I don't know if that was also your 30th anniversary as the, your first visit to the mountain gorillas or is it this year this year this year okay um, I'd like to know I do hear a number of people advocating for more and more wild gorillas to be habituated but also there's a discussion going around to increase the number of visitors to the mountain gorillas to 12. I know back in 20, was it 2010, there were six. Uh, then the, the, the number was increased to the eight that we have today. And I hear people are asking for more. Uh, do you feel like the, we, we should be putting uh, a, a foot on the gas, on the, on the brake pedal or should we not worry too much about it? Are we just being, if I could call them hardcore conservationists, or should we <laughs> really be concerned when such conversations come up? We should be very concerned because responsible tourism to gorillas and chimpanzees, which we're so closely related to that we can make each other sick, is a responsibility for everyone. Yeah. Not only the government or the donors, but the tour operators, the tourists, the conservationists, all of us who want these animals to be around for future generations, it's our responsibility. Yeah. Um, gorilla tourism, I know in my chapter says is tourism a necessary evil. For gorillas, it's something you really have to think about and chimpanzees as well. Yeah. Because how much is too much? The money is so much. Um, now, when I started out, people were paying $250 to visit gorillas for a non-resident. Mm. Now it's gone up to $800. Yeah over these past 30 years. Um, in Rwanda, it's even higher. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's now, it was 1,502, but I hear they're increasing it even further wow. for foreign and residents. Um, so the money is a lot. And the, we minimize the people who visit the gorillas. It used to be six, yeah. now it's eight. Both to prevent behavior disturbance, too much behavior disturbance, but to minimize the people visiting them and the disease transmission. And also when you're with the gorillas and you're so many, you can't even get good photos. And it's hard for the guide, the ranger guide, to manage the people. Mm. But the more people you bring, the more risks you bring to the gorillas. Yeah. So it's, it's rather than increasing the number of people, we'd rather increase the price. You know, so that because it's all about getting more money from them. Yeah. So why not increase the price? And now because it's the only place in the world to safely see mountain gorillas is Uganda and Rwanda, people, the permits are still fully booked in the high season. Mm. You're not going to discourage people. Um, the Wildlife Authority has tried in the low season to reduce the permit so that more people can come, expatriates, Ugandans. And in fact, for Ugandans, it's much less. Yeah. But still very few Ugandans. So many visits. people don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ugandans is just, yeah. as the Ua Idi in Samwanda said, don't quote it in dollars, quote it in shillings. Yeah. It's, it's been 250,000 shillings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is about $70. But for the foreign non resident, it was 10 times as much. Mm. So we need to have. Um, we need to find that delicate balance. Yes, we want them, they're really lifting people out of poverty mm. around Windy, the whole country, because some of the money from guerrilla tourism goes to support national parks and wildlife reserves that don't have enough, don't have enough tourists to cover operational costs, you know, to pay for rangers, patrols, and all that. Yeah. So Uganda has 22 protected areas and only about six 
or seven of them ha can raise enough money to cover operational costs. Mm -hmm. So gorilla tourism money goes to support the other protected areas. Yeah. So, um, but it's a very delicate balance. If we have too many people and you wipe out a gorilla group, yeah. then that money will not be there. The COVID pandemic was a big challenge because COVID, just like we can easily, we were picking it up from each other very easily. Yeah. We were so worried the gorillas would pick it. So immediately everyone had to start wearing masks. Um, the distance increased from seven meters to 10 meters. Extra checks, they measure your temperature before you go in, much more hand washing, everything. And now monkeypox is also something to worry about just yeah. now. You know, because monkeypox mm -hmm. is now in DRC, which is near Buindi, yeah. near bordering the gorilla parks and the chimpanzee parks. So, and it's in Uganda now. So, all those diseases can easily jump back and forth mm -hmm. between people and animals. So, it's something that we have to be very, very, very concerned about. Yeah. And so, it's important to have that delicate balance. But interestingly, the mountain gorilla populations which have grown, the gorilla populations that have grown are only the mountain gorillas, where there's viable ecotourism. It contributes even more to Rwanda revenue than Uganda because Rwanda has only about, I think, four national parks, four, four protected areas. Yeah. Uganda has 22. And so, but it has to be done carefully. Rwanda, mm. even if they double the price, they still have, they still, their groups are still yeah. full. <laughs> so it shows that there's a high demand for this product. Yeah. Instead of increasing the people, let's increase, increase the, price. the price. Yeah. Okay. That's but it's definitely helping a lot. And it's the reason why the numbers of mountain gorillas are growing. Yeah. The mountain gorillas, when I first started out, were only about 650, and now they're over 1,000. Yeah. And we hope in the next census we'll count many more, which is going to start towards the end of this year, okay. in Bwindi and then Birunga later when it's safer. Okay. So for sure, um, tourism, you'd say, is a necessary evil. It has to be done very, very carefully. Very carefully. Yeah, yeah and <laughs> actually, during the pandemic, even if people couldn't visit the gorillas, we told them you can buy coffee yeah. and we can keep farmers or poachers out of the forest. Yeah. They give them a good price for good coffee. So the pandemic also showed us that as much as it's a necessary evil, you shouldn't over depend on it. Yeah. There has to be other ways that communities can earn a living sustainably beyond yeah. tourism. Because they were using tourism money to buy food. Mm. So they were starving and poaching went up during the pandemic. Yeah. So now we told them, we started supporting them with ready to grow gardens so they can, they're fast growing seedlings yeah. that can grow in a, within four months so that they know that they always have food to eat. Okay. So even when tourism came back, we said, when tourism comes back, continue to have something to eat. The money from tourism can be for paying school fees or other things, but not for feeding you. Because yeah. we found that people are poaching because they were hungry. And so coffee is a good food security crop as well, because you can plant it with other food crops, and the money from coffee can help you to buy food. Yeah. And so those are all the things that we're trying to promote within the community, so that they're not just depending on tourism, to survive to survive yeah mm. Mm. now maybe just finally when you talked about balancing this thing tourism and conservation um each time i'm down in Bwindi and i get areas of the forest it's quite a stark contrast between the forest and if i could call it human settlement yes um you have the humans which the human side which looks extremely dry <laughs> and then you exactly. have the forest <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and and when you are just talking earlier you said that the number of martin gorillas is continuing to increase and increase which is a plus which we are all happy about uh, but i i don't know if there is going to reach a time when these mountain gorillas run out of space and if that's something that concerns you guys in conservation or it's not really a big deal <laughs> i know for a fact that um, among the primates, it's, it's just us and the mountain gorillas. No, among the great apes, it's just us and the mountain gorillas whose population is increasing. So as you have, <laughs> <laughs> you have more humans increasing, then you have uh -huh. more mountain gorillas increasing, but that little forest is not really increasing in size. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about this or is this something we shouldn't really be concerned about? It's something we're very concerned about. Yeah. As the numbers keep going up, can uh, those numbers, can the forest sustain those large population of mountain gorillas? Yeah. Yes, it's something we're very concerned about. Um, since uh, when I first worked with them, they're about 300. Now there's over 459. So they're almost doubling. Yeah. Basically, hopefully census will 
show that they've even doubled. Um, but the space is not growing. Yeah. And in fact, there's, so it's resulting in more and more gorillas having their home range, some of their home range outside the park. And so we uh, something that Conservation Through Public Health is doing is speaking to community members who are willing to sell their land to lodges to try and sell it for the public good so that we can expand Windy. So that's something that we're working on very closely okay. with the Windy National Park Management. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be able to convince people to expand the land yeah. because Windy needs to expand. And anyway, they can't do anything with that land. That's why they're willing to sell it to a tour operator to put up a lodge. But the lodges will lock the gorillas in and then there'll be more conflict because then they'll go to lodges and even pick up diseases. Yeah. So it's very important that we act fast before it's too late. And it's something that we're working on as conservation through public health. Okay. Then this is the final question. <laughs> this is more of a personal question. I feel like you've done it all, if I could use that as a phrase. <laughs> um, yes, you've won, you've won so many awards and many more, I guess, are on the way. Um, you've created change in the communities, you've impacted lives, you've transformed gorillas, uh, the lives of the, of the gorillas from the times they had suffering from scabies, um, got them through the COVID pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to know what else is there to be done? Um, what does the future look like for Dr. Gladys, uh, CTPH, Gorilla Conservation Coffee, and all this beautiful work that you're doing? I would say that um, there's still a lot to be done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we still have a lot to be done. As much as we've done a lot, yeah. we still, there's still a lot to be done. <laughs> yeah. We would like to make sure that all the gorilla species are safe in Africa. We want to reverse the trend of extinction like we did at Windy. So we'd like to team up with partners in different countries in Africa. Gorillas are found in 10 countries in Africa. And we want to team up with all those partners to be able to scale our model of conservation through public health and gorilla conservation coffee okay. within those 10 countries in Africa. Yeah. So that's one big ambitious plan we have. We also want to see how we can work with other partners within Uganda to scale the One Health model in other protected areas like Queen Elizabeth National Park, yeah. Jesus Savannah Park, Murchison Falls, Kidepo, Pianupe Wildlife Reserve. We've done a little bit of work there, but would love it to be sustained by the local partners. Yeah. Um, and other places in Africa, we want to engage children more in conservation. Um, I'm the vice president of the African Primatological Society, which where we're building African leadership in primate research and conservation. We held the second conference here in Uganda in 2019. We had over 300 delegates, and the Minister of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, Honorable Ephraim Kamuntu, was guest of honor representing the Prime Minister, Honorable Rukahana Rugunda, at the mm -hmm. time, and we had a Japanese ambassador there. It was a really high profile event. And we had 85% of delegates were African, local Africans presenting papers. Normally it's the other way around. 10% are local Africans. If you go to the International Primate Society and the biggest delegations other than Uganda were from Nigeria, South Africa and Madagascar. No, sorry, Nigeria and Madagascar. Those mm -hmm. were the biggest delegations. So we want to really have a homegrown movement of African conservationists. There's uh, pa some partners in Nigeria who'd like to partner with us, Obudu Conservation Center. They came to visit us recently. Uh, Della, um, she's called, um, she wants to help us to, basically, she wants to do s some of our One Health approach in Nigeria. She founded Obudu Conservation Center with her mom. So we want to just get more and more Africans leading these efforts. We want to engage the next generation in conservation. Yeah. And my sons have been kind of a bit, they've been there as part of it from when they were little. Yeah. So like Indigo recognized his first elephant in the national park when he was two. Nice. Elephant, he called it. Ah. <laughs> and uh, I was excited when he wrote this book, oh, Zookeeper nice. for a Week. When he was 13, he worked at the zoo yeah. and wrote an article for Toto magazine, which ended up in a book a few years later. Um, him and his little brother, are very much into conservation and they have many children in the Bindi community who are their friends. Yeah. I've ever taken them plus two children, a girl and a boy, teenagers. I took Indigo, the girl and the boy, to the gorillas when they were 15, 16 years old and they got to see the gorillas and it was called an engine science show um, where the children were leading 
the efforts. And Tendo led the effort in the lab because he was only 12. Yeah. So it's so important to get children into conservation. Lots of children want to go and have this experience Indigo had because of this. Little children, ha you know, he's their hero. Yeah. Because they're seeing <laughs> someone who looks like them. Yeah. He's out there also protecting the animals yeah. in the zoo. So we're really grateful to Dr. James Musingis and his team for making this possible. So yes, we want to engage more and more youth in conservation. I'm on the board of Wildlife Clubs of Uganda. Jen the, Do the Jengudo Institute has roots and shoots. Mm. Um, all those programs are really helping that the next generation will be conservationists. The next generation of parliamentarians will have many, a greater percentage who are conservationists. You don't have to have conversations about cutting down Bugoma Forest Reserve to plant sugarcane. Yeah. If you have more and more people in parliament who care about wildlife yeah. and understand that if wildlife is secure and the forests are secure, our future is much more secure. So we need to have <coughs> a lot more of those. We need to engage the next generation much more in, in conservation. Yeah. So there's still a lot to do, <laughs> very much a lot to do. I'm also yeah. on the Women for Environment Leadership Council, where we're mentoring women to lead conservation efforts, if that's what they want to do. Yeah. So I'm a founder member of We Africa, which was started by people in Kenya, initiated by a lady called Dr. Lela Haza, mm -hmm. who founded Lion Guardians, and she convinced all of us who are there, the leadership council, um, we're about eight of us to really help. And so every year we train about 25 women in the cohort and they each, each of them um, are part of this and they improve whatever they're doing, whichever field of conservation they're in. We've had lawyers there, we've had, you know, all kinds of people. As long as they're doing something to do in the environment and conservation, they can be part of that cohort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a fantastic point to end today's episode on. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Dr. <laughs> Gladys. Um, and if you are listening, please go and look for Walking with Gorillas. Uh, look for the book. It's a really, really fantastic book. Um, you, <laughs> we, we only have a few minutes here that we can have a chat about Dr. Kalema's uh, illustrious journey. But if you'd like to really dive deep, and really um, enjoy this story further, uh, please pick up the book. Uh, we'll leave links down below to how you can uh, keep tabs with CTPH and Gorilla Conservation Coffee. So if you are listening to this on any of your streaming platforms, you will find that in the podcast description below. And if, you're, if you are watching this on YouTube, you'll find this in the video description. And something else I'd like to actually do is start a blog. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've mentioned it, it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I have a new communications manager, Cosmas Matembe, and he's gonna, we're going to work on that blog every week okay. about other things to do with conservation and things yeah. which are connected to conservation. Um, because every time I, I see things, I see things changing, moving. Some are very exciting, some are very depressing, and I mm. feel that it's important to raise awareness about these issues through a blog. Yeah. Um, and yeah, keep following us on social media and thank you so much for hosting us. Beyond all odds, she did it, carving out a path of her own and now inspiring people, young and not so young, all across the world to go out there and do what they love, creating positive change in this world that needs it the most. And we must be reminded that building a better Uganda, Africa, or even the world at large is a responsibility for us all. And I think with the One Health approach that Dr. Gladys Kalema and her team crafted so many years ago, we can all indeed agree that the future of wildlife lies in the hands of those who live next to those places where it roams naturally. Indeed, the future of our continent's wildlife lies in the hands of those wise indigenous communities who've lived and coexisted with this wildlife for centuries upon centuries. We will leave links down below to the CTPH website and Gorilla Conservation Coffee as well. So feel free to look out for that. And I cannot say it enough, <laughs> get yourself a copy of Walking with Gorillas. That's a book by Dr. Gladys Kalema. I think it's available in both a digital version through Kindle and this lovely hardcover copy that I'm so fortunate to own. <laughs> yeah, so get yourself a copy. It's a beautiful story that I think everyone can learn so many lessons from and also get 
a lot of inspiration from as well. Alright guys, that should be the end of today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And if you did, go ahead and hit that like button, share the link in your circles, and let's get this conversation beyond this platform. And for those of you who just can't have enough and would like to hear or listen to more of such conversations, make it a point to subscribe to the podcast. And also check out some of those earlier episodes that we've done. There are plenty of those <laughs> that we've done in the past. And for those listening through Apple Podcasts, let me remind you that you can leave a star rating as well as a review on the podcast. That really helps us. As we already said, the podcast is available on all major streaming platforms, including Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube Music, Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Castbox, Pandora. And for those tuning in in the US, you will also be able to access it through iHeartRadio. If you'd like to make a contribution to the conversation in the future, uh, feel free to send me an email on contact at jonathanbenaya.com or ahabenathan at pm.me. And you never know, your question could be featured in one of the future episodes. Both those email addresses will be linked down below in the podcast notes and YouTube description, if that's where you're accessing the podcast from. And maybe just lastly, I'd like to say a very big thank you to our patrons. It's through your monthly pledges that we're able to keep this platform alive. And as I said at the beginning, if you'd like to join this community, there will be a link down below in the podcast notes and the video description for those listening through YouTube. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in. And let's meet again in the next one. The Jonathan Benaya podcast and its sister show, the Africa Safari podcast are not only inspired by nature and travel, but by the people that work in it and for it.